This is Robert Valley, and uh, this is the director's commentary for the Pear Cider and Cigarettes uh, movie on DVD. And uh, I'm just uh, sitting here, and I'm I was about to cue the movie, and I just wanted to uh, get my head around what I'm going to be talking about here. So I'm going through the movie. Uh, I'm probably going to try to keep it away from any sort of technical information because I, I, I pretty much covered all that in my script to screen book. So I thought it would be, you know, interesting to maybe talk about some of the stories behind, behind the scenes here uh, as I'm playing through them. I suspect that I might have more to say than I'm going to have time in a 35-minute movie if I play it at speed, so I'm probably going to have to pause the movie here and there just to finish what I'm talking about, and then I'll continue playing. So uh, so I'm just going to start this movie. I'm going to turn the volume down. And uh, so this first scene is, uh, this is my mother's house in North Vancouver. The, the doorbell rang one day. And, uh, you know, just, just as what's happening here in the film, I went to go answer and there's nobody there. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I opened the door and, uh, saw a Christmas card there. And, uh, I did notice a car driving off. So, you know, I put the pieces together. I suspected it was, it looked like Techno's parents' vehicle. And so I, I opened up this letter, and it was this envelope, and it was a letter from, from my friend Techno. And I couldn't find the real letter. I've been looking around for it because I thought it'd be cool to have his real writing in there, but uh, Techno was a bit dyslexic. And uh, so I, I tried to make the writing look as, as funky as possible. But, yeah, there was a check in there for $1,000. And uh, before Techno died... He actually asked me uh, what what I would like, you know, of his in the event that he died, and he had this red Mazda RX-7 parked uh, at his house uh, in Kelowna, and I just kind of said jokingly, "Yeah, I'll take your car." <laughs> so I was a little disappointed when I saw that check for a thousand dollars. Not really, but. I wonder what happened to that car. I don't know. And then, yeah, this this is a uh, a photo of Techno that we found. Uh, he had come over. It was right after he arrived in Vancouver, and he came over for Christmas dinner, and he was looking skeletal and pretty much the worst I had ever seen him. But he had this big smile on his face, and that, that's a Santa Claus hat that he had on, and he decided to have Christmas dinner with the Valley family, and uh, we we took this picture. And just incidentally, Techno Stipes is not his real name; that's an anagram of his real name. So, I didn't really want to have my name connected with you know Techno's real name for the rest of my life. You know, it just uh, if you did a search, the two things would probably come up together. But then I thought it'd be cool if you know my my name was linked to the word techno, and uh, I don't know, it just kind of worked. He seemed like a sort of a techno kind of guy, and uh, I'm just going to continue playing here. Yeah, so, Pear Cider and Cigarettes, you know, we, we had kicked around a few different titles for this film. This film takes place in Vancouver, and uh, we have this, uh, we have a bridge here that's got three lanes on it because it was built back in a time where nobody could have conceived of the, of the population that exists here now. So the middle lane alternates, uh, depending on which way the traffic's going. So I thought three lane bridge would be a weird, no, a, a different, uh, and kind of ambiguous name for the film. We definitely had our adventures on the bridge with techno and you know, going down that middle lane when we shouldn't have, uh, with him at the wheel. And uh, it's just kind of something that didn't really catch on. And uh, we kind of came back to Pear Cider and Cigarettes, Kara and myself, because, uh, I don't know, 
Some people had a hard time pronouncing this title, and that's why I was kind of searching around for something different. But at the end of the day, there, there's just something, uh, I don't know, something we just we liked about this, and we just came back to it. So, pear cider and cigarettes. It's Leo, oh, Leo's cool idea to do those graphics there. Yeah, so it's a fucking airplane shot. So what do you want me to say about this? So yeah, there's Techno's dad in the window there, and uh, we had had this conversation in Techno's father's house at the kitchen table, where you know he uh, Techno was in China, and, and uh, his dad and I were talking, and I I guess I said, you know, quite frankly, what's going on with your son? Um, is he going to get back home? And and he said. I don't know. Uh, he doesn't want us to come over there. And uh, as much as we want to, he, he says he'd, he'd threaten to jump out of the window if we arrived in China. So it, it just seemed like an impossible situation. And so I don't know if I offered or, or if he suggested it, but somehow we came to the uh, possibility that, that maybe I could go back to China that might be more acceptable to techno if, if one, he had one of his buddies there. And, uh, it's hard to say really what was going on in his head, but, uh, you know, but we had this conversation and so th that's how this whole plan came up. And so th now we transition into China and, uh, of course, this is my imagination here. I, I, I have no way to know what was going on in China when I wasn't there, but but he had gotten to an altercation with uh, some other some other uh, Chinese people in Guangzhou, and I, I don't know what happened, but I, I suppose there was some drink involved, and and uh, and uh, he got in a fight with some people, and he was uh, he was like I said he was sick, which was amazing to me that he would be fighting. Uh, under these circumstances. I don't know, man. You know, I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for techno or anything. It's, it's not the point. The point is I'm just trying to tell you the events as I, as, as I was able to re recollect them. Yeah, techno got his arse kicked. But yeah, techno... Uh, he was in a car accident when we were 17. I'll get to this later. And he was also in a motorbike accident, which is, you know, it's clear from watching the movie that, you know, I get into these accidents here. I'm not sure how much more there is to say. But basically, you know, I'm just trying to uh, tell you the situation as it was in China before I got over there. It was a bad scene. So this, you know, the credits, it's a co-production with Passion Pictures. I've known these guys for a long time. And in fact, there was one point where early on I was having a meeting with Andrew Ruman from Passion Pictures. And I didn't have this whole sequence coming up here, this whole sort of flashback sequence where I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, techno throwing balls and kicking balls and, you know, the effect that he had on me when I was a kid. But he thought, you know, it'd be good to sort of be able to you know, pump up the emotional level a little bit. And especially if you could sort of uh, put a little bit more, give us a bit more information about your relationship with techno when he was a kid. That was Andrew's suggestion. And so I was a little reluctant to, to add scenes to the film just for the purpose of making, you know, a better movie. It was kind of uh, opposed to, to my thinking about how I wanted to tell the story, but... There was a point where I was sitting here, and I was thinking about what Andrew was saying, and I remembered all the stuff that took place that I hadn't really thought about in years. And I just, uh, you know, unscripted, I just uh, uh, picked up the microphone, and I started recalling events off the top of my head. And so that's where this whole sequence came from, and I'm just so happy that uh, Andrew gave me that suggestion early on, because this is really kind of my favorite part of the movie. A little bit like the deer hunter, I suppose. I kind of, I wanted to, to establish some good times early on, 
just before things go real bad later, just so it feels like something's lost. And so this whole sequence here with, uh, you know, it's, it, it's kind of bathed in sunlight and golden light. And uh, that's precisely the way I wanted it. I wanted, I wanted this particular sequence to be, you know, like the light of summer. Uh, you know, the way you might, uh, you know, imagine, you know, your youth. Because, uh, uh, yeah, it was fun as hell. It was fun as hell. But it's true. Holy crap, Techno was fast. He showed up to our school and he was he was skinny as all hell. You know, he hadn't quite filled out yet. But man, when he ran... He, it was, it was incredible, really. And, uh, you know, he played all these sports. He played hockey and, and uh, basketball, not basketball, but baseball and everything. Yeah, the, I, 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 I dug up some old drawings from my mom's house, you know, the earliest drawings, and I, I decided to put them right into the film, which I thought was kind of a cool touch. You know, I, I, uh, these were probably from when I was like four or five years old. And so yeah, we used to skateboard through these streets of, of uh, Vancouver, you know, through West Vancouver and North Shore. And it's just great streets for, for skateboarding. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, Techno and I were at the, the school and he, uh, he really did go berserk. He, he broke about 20 windows at the school, like I say in the, in the movie here. We're so dumb. We just, we just stayed at the school. You know, I, I think one of the neighbors at the school probably heard all this, all this glass breaking. <laughs> and we just casually walked home afterwards. If we were a bit smarter, you know, we would have taken an alternate route. But we just took all the, like, the, the normal streets home. So it really wasn't hard to sort of track us down. I'm sure the neighbors sort of got a description of us, too. So, you know, this life of crime was, was, it was new to us. So we hadn't really, uh, we hadn't really, uh, thought it out too well. And, uh, it must've been pretty funny. My mom, you know, she, I, I, at the beginning of the evening, I said, okay, I'm going to go out with my friend Techno. Uh, and I walk out with my tennis racket and about an hour later, I come back home in a police car. So that uh, that actually really was the first time I I went out with Techno there. We we started hanging around, and if you notice in one of these uh, one of these points where the light comes up, it's, you, you, I'm looking over uh, at the police car, and you can see Techno as a child. And then I thought it would be cool if if uh, during one of the lights, the second one here, you see that he's grown into an adolescent there and that this all takes place within within the flashing lights of the police car because this was a uh something that would that would continue for for tech now is is he spent a lot of the time in the back of police cars i remember being uh you know a kid and we were over at uh, Techno's girlfriend's house, and uh, they were always making out, and uh, we were always just doing our kid stuff. And uh, you kind of moved her around so her her rear end was facing the room, and then he lifted up her, sort of gave her a, a wedgie with the underwear, and kind of exposed her ass cheeks. That imagery just kind of sizzled into my imagination, and so. I just, uh, I just remember that so clearly. <laughs> uh, anyways, so this clearly marks the end of the good times in this film. And this next sequence is, is kind of, uh, it's all about, whereas that last sequence was all about sunlight and, and, uh, and the good part of youth. This is kind of where things start to take a little turn. And it's, it's mostly, in contrast to that last sequence, it's, it's mostly nighttime shots. 
And so this sequence is kind of addressing, you know, the other side of techno, which is, uh, uh, I don't think techno slept very much because uh, he spent a lot of time sort of roaming the neighborhoods. and uh, Then he'd have to get back home in time for hockey and then get to school. So, uh, you know, I keep coming back to this uh, idea of him diving off the cliff at uh, Lighthouse Park. Motherfucker was crazy. So I don't know if you guys did this, but uh, but we used to we used to smoke hash with hot knives on the stove. That's kind of a, a little homage to to the the kind of because every time you used to go to someone's house, and you you look through their cutlery drawer, the knives would always be burnt at the end, which was kind of funny. <laughs> My buddy Paul, he fucking took his parents' uh, good cutlery, like the gold stuff. <laughs> he started hot knifing with, with the good cutlery. And, I don't know. Those fucking kids are stupid, man. So this is my, uh, you know, the rock and roll t-shirt sequence. You know, these are all t-shirts that Techno would have had and kind of, uh, uh, being juxtaposed with some of these activities that, you know, just to give you like the spectrum of kind of things that, that were, you know, that would be typical, you know, it's, it's kind of things that were taking place at that time. So, you know, in a nutshell, I'm trying to get as, across as much information as possible. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, techno, he, he, <laughs> he loved to hitchhike everywhere, you know, he hitchhiked to school and and so uh, this this would have been Techno's room, and uh, his room was full of stuff, stuff, music, uh, musical instruments, and skateboards, and the TV was always on. We weren't watching Seinfeld back then, but the boy was a collector, and he accumulated a lot of stuff, and. Uh, And, you know, this particular sequence, descending downwards, I suppose, is what's happening here. I think he stole some, uh, some uh, power tools out of the auto body shop uh, at high school. And this really pissed off all the senior students, and they had his number. So it seemed like if you're like, sort of out and about with techno, and one of those senior students would spot him, then he'd just run off, and then uh, a chase would ensue, and he'd always end up out, out running them and out foxing them. But if you were kind of with him and you were a slower runner, chances are you might just get your arse kicked just by having an association with them. So it was kind of dangerous to be out. <laughs> it was kind of dangerous. You were sort of taking your safety into your, into your own hands a bit when you went out with techno. I kind of wanted the sequence to look a little bit like uh, that chase sequence with the uh, the warriors, the baseball furies, you know. I just wanted like this the high adrenaline kind of chase. I'm not sure if I pulled it off, but that, that's what I was thinking. And so, uh, So, techno, uh, I guess this montage here is, is kind of leading up to techno's accident. He was really running wild, you know, and getting everybody upset at him, and nobody could trust him. It felt like uh, he was really on the edge of something bad happening. And, and sure enough, something did happen. And it wasn't really his doing, because he, he wasn't really at the wheel of this car when this accident happened. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about any specifics about, you know, car accidents. And I'm not trying to put the finger on, of blame on anybody. But, uh, you know, this is just what happened. And uh, this is part of the, part of the, uh, part of the story. You know, kids... Uh, 
kids go to parties and they, they drive when they shouldn't drive and sometimes people get hurt and sometimes uh, their lives aren't the same afterwards and, and that's all I have to say about that. I didn't really have any way of fact checking this but apparently he was ejected out of the back window of this car. He kind of ragdolled down the street and was found 50 yards away from the crash site in the bush. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, the fact that Techno could, he, if you're diving off a cliff, and the moment you hit the water, he had this sort of technique where he'd sort of curl, curl uh, his body around so he wouldn't end up going too deep. It's that kind of being able to make decisions under that kind of pressure, which I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to pull off, but he was able to sort of keep a cool head. And I, I, I kind of have this belief that this is, what, this is what saved him in this accident. In a split second, in the moment that he was ejected from that car, somehow he, he was able to, to roll with the accident. And even though the injuries were horrific, part of me thinks that it could have been a lot worse if it was somebody else. And the fact that he was still alive, to me, suggested that there was, there was still something kind of special about his ability to to pull out of things. I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have been able to, to to recover and survive the way he did. So I always had found that kind of fascinating in a way. And so this is Techno. Uh, when I went to go visit him in the hospital, and literally I, I was on my way to Calgary, and uh, I was trying to get away from, from my friends and everything here that was kind of pulling me down because nothing was really happening. And, and uh, I just ended up in Calgary. I also spent a lot of time washing dishes. Um, but meanwhile, he was recovering from this accident. It, it probably wasn't easy. It probably wasn't easy. And I guess that's the idea. Is that we were all going to college and going traveling and doing stuff. And he was kind of stuck in the hospital when this should have been the time where he, where he would have also been doing a lot of things. So, you know, what the hell do I know about that? I, I would come and see him when I came back to Vancouver. And at first he was in a wheelchair and then he was hobbling around on crutches. And, and uh, I'd go visit him. He's living downtown here in Vancouver. And we'd put up these big rolls of paper and, and uh, we always kind of enjoyed drawing together. You know, we'd, we'd have a few drinks and we'd draw and we'd kind of just riff off each other's drawings on big rolls of paper and um, listen to uh, Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. That's kind of what we were listening to back then. He was always going on about like this. He's going to make, uh, have a big settlement and all this big talk about, you know, he's going to be a millionaire. And, and then one day it actually did happen. The result was that he ended up with a, a big settlement of money at the end of all this. And I don't know what to say about Jennifer, man. Like, there was this time we were over at Techno's house in Horseshoe Bay. We were uh, watching his widescreen TV. I think his friend Wes was there too. So the three of us were there. And Techno says, Oh, I want to show you something on uh, on TV. And he found this VHS tape and he put it in. And I don't know if he meant this or not, but it ended up being like uh, like this home uh, pornography movie that he had shot himself with him and Jennifer. And uh, it was the two of them fucking. Uh, except uh, there was this function on the TV where there's a little box in the lower corner and you could see another channel. So right where, they're, right where they were bumping uglies, where all the penetration was, <laughs> this guy in this infomercial was polishing this ore, you know, like, uh, like a paddling ore. And it was, it was just the funniest like, little coincidence where, you know, you can see their faces and all, the, all these sexual positions. And right where, right where all the junk is, you can see this guy kind of shining up the, the, the shaft of this ore. And we were sitting there, and we were just, you know, happily watching this little home porno movie. And, uh, and then Jennifer walked in, and uh, 
she was loaded. She, she, she came in in her underpants. She caught a taxi, and she was wearing a shoe. And I remember. And she had a seat between the two of us, or the three of us. And she goes, oh, you guys are watching a porno movie. And then, and then she started watching it. And then she realized that she was in the movie. And then uh, it didn't seem to bother anybody. And so the four of us are there just kind of watching this, this movie. And, of course, more drinks were sort of uh, were consumed. And, and things gradually sort of got a little bit pear-shaped. But that's kind of typical of the kind of shenanigans that were going on over there in Horseshoe Bay. It was funny because Techno, uh, he, he didn't really sweat the, the big stuff. Like, uh, he had no problems, you know, buying a boat or spending a bunch of money on renting a, a house in Kelowna and keeping the swimming pool uh, heated in the wintertime. You know, all this stuff would have added to tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, but he, he on, on the other hand, he, he kind of sweated the small stuff. Like, he used to roll up, like, cigarette butts out of the ashtrays and and drink the ends of people's drinks when you're out. And it's it just like this odd, this odd kind of skittish behavior, which was really strange for a guy that you knew was, was a millionaire. So, um, and then, okay, this whole sequence with Jennifer, I, I, you know, it's just, the police were always out at Horseshoe Bay. Someone was always phoning the police and, and, uh, you know, they're, they're gradually slipping into alcoholism. And, uh, and this went on for a few years, and, you know. And uh, Techno was riding his motorbike one day, and he used to tell this story about, like, he was riding his motorbike, and he clipped the toe pedal off of the, of the motorbike, and it, and it took his big toe right along with it. And the doctor that was uh, treating him in the hospital, I think his name was Dr. Sugar or something, but he kind of knew the guy. And so when Te Techno came to at the hospital, he's, Dr. Sugar's there and he's looking at him. And Techno says to him, oh, did you cut off my toe? And the doctor said, no. And he says, oh, you mean I kept my toe? And he goes, no. And Techno says, what happened? And he says, you cut off your toe. And then we would all laugh. That was like the big punchline there. So uh, he definitely had a sense of humor about all this stuff. Like in, in the face of tragedy, he just, he kept his sense of humor. He never really got too dark about that stuff. And it, it did bug him a lot, for sure. When he lost that toe, you know, he, he was crippled badly from that first accident. But losing his big toe, that's what really screwed up his walk. And he, he used to say, man, I had no idea how important that big toe was when you're walking around. But, uh, you know, in the big scheme of things, I'm, I'm kind of more crippled without that than, than that other horrific injury I had, you know, in that car accident. And, uh, and this is Horseshoe Bay, you know, uh, Techno spent uh, a little over a decade out here in Horseshoe Bay. He bought a house out there, and what can I say about Horseshoe Bay? You know, it's the end of the road, literally, if you're in Vancouver. Uh, but one day I went up to Horseshoe Bay to, to go visit him, and I pulled over, and uh, I remember he did lean in the, in the car, and... and uh, I noticed, yeah, he was yellow, and he told me that he had hepatitis C, and I didn't really understand too much about hep C back then. He kind of shook it off. Just like the story goes, they ended up suing the Vancouver General Hospital for another big chunk of money. Techno played his music loud, and uh, that little cast of characters in Horseshoe Bay... They were kind of a bad news group of people. I don't know where he gathered these people up, but it would always change because somebody would always end up stealing from him. It was always a bit of a nightmare going out there. Yeah. 
pretty much just repeating what's happening in the movie. It's not very, very insightful, I guess. So this sequence right here, again, it, this is one of the only parts in the movie that I kind of invented. Because, of course, I don't know if Techno actually stood on that bridge. Uh, you know, I, he came over one day, and, and he was explaining. He had been close to death a couple of times. And, uh, and I asked him, what, what was it like? You know, what are you talking about? What did, did, what did you experience? And he says, I, I just experienced like this edge, you know, like this edge of existence. And I knew that I could, I could cross over. Uh, basically, into death, you know, like, and, and cease living. And then he, he says, you know, I, I kind of wanted to live. I, I, I wasn't quite ready to do that yet. And I guess this is kind of a pivotal point, you know, with him standing on the edge of the bridge and having a drink. Because, you know, I guess this is the part of the story where I'm, I'm trying to get across this idea that he kind of regrouped and uh, decided that he wanted to, to continue living and to go through the, the, the steps of, of trying to get a liver replacement and, um, you know, kind of a, a, a determined uh, road to recovery, I suppose. But this is all very difficult uh, because he was he was a ferocious drunk. So, you know, whereas his intentions probably were good, the fact is is that he was being gripped, you know, pretty heavily by by alcohol and, you know, uh, and uh, he wasn't going to get a liver in Canada. He had to go elsewhere, and uh, that's why he ended up in China. And this is China. You know, I was out there uh, getting my books printed with my friend Hugh. And my brother was also teaching English in China. And so, uh, you know, I had a couple of reasons for being in China. And totally coincidentally, I got a call from Techno's mother. And she said, hey, you know, Techno's in China right now. And, and he'd probably love to see you. And, um, and we went down to, uh, to go see him. And... Uh, and then, uh, you know, as we talked to him, we realized, you know, how he got there. And he met this shady dude in Vancouver. His name was Vince. And Vince, uh, Vince ba basically took uh, $250,000 and, and introduced Techno to the military hospital in Guangzhou. And uh, I guess you could call him a broker, but he was in the business of, of just uh, brokering deals between transplant patients and the military hospital, and, and he just made these incredible commissions out of it. And so he seemed like a real shyster to us. But uh, he showed up at the right time, you know, and he said the right things. And so that's how Techno ended up in China. And so uh, Hugh, my friend Hugh and myself and Hugh's family, we went to, to Guangzhou to the White Swan restaurant to meet him. And... Yeah, you know, just as I say here, he, he looked horrible. Like, he was completely sketched out in a way that I hadn't seen him sketched out before. And I guess all those years of hard living and, you know, the disease had sort of caught up to him. But, uh, you know, my dad at this time was probably close to 90 years old. And without exaggerating, he was probably in better physical shape than Techno was at this age, which was probably around 35 or 36. So, you know, just to give you an idea of how, how you know, how sketched out he was at this time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we had a night out. Was, my wife was there, too. And uh, Techno says, yeah, yeah, come and stay with us. We got an extra room at the hospital. And I agreed, which was immediately a mistake because, you know, things... You know, Techno went on a little uh, late night walk and and uh, he was out looking for more liquor and it caused this big argument with his, uh, his wife and it was really uncomfortable. And, you know, you wanted to basically run away from the situation and get some place where, where things were kind of normal again. So that's kind of what was happening here. And, you know, we kind of 
happily left techno thinking, okay, that's not our problem anymore. Let's, you know, let's wish the best for him. And we'll see him back again in Vancouver when he gets his liver transplant. But uh, as things turned out, um, that didn't happen. And uh, gradually, uh, you know, uh, his wife uh, couldn't handle being in China anymore. And she left him there by himself. And Techno didn't want his folks to come over. And he was, uh, thought, I, you know, part of me thinks that he just wanted this time alone in China so he could do what he really wanted to do and, and live life out the way, the way that he wanted to. You know, uh, not necessarily in the hospital, but uh, if he chose to drink and smoke himself to death, then, then I think he was going to do that. But I, I don't think he wanted to be alone. And so he kept calling me up and saying, can you please come out to China? You know, uh, uh, I need your help. Um, when are you coming out to China? And I guess gradually I just kind of felt like, uh, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know what to say. I just... There's been a few points where people, they don't really understand my motivation for going to China. And this is kind of at the core of this movie. This is, this is what this film is about. It's like in my life, there's probably about three or four people, you know, that I, that I, that I know since childhood. And these are kind of friends that you have unconditionally. It doesn't mean like you have a lot in common or like you're, you're the best of buddies. It just means like you have a lot of history together. And, you know, even though, you know, I can't say that, you know, Techno and I were the best of friends at this point. There's something about just all the history that we had together that just kind of made it justifiable that I would, you know, uh, go over and, and uh, to China and, um, you know, agree to spend... Um, to spend uh, as much time as, as was needed to, to get this job done. And that's the end of part one. The second half of the movie is really the second graphic novel. Yeah. So uh, I arrived in China, and, uh, and the first person I saw there was Flora. Techno was off bumming a smoke or something like that. And Flora, she was really the nicest person. You know, uh, we still keep in touch with Flora. Flora was uh, hired by Vince to look after Techno. Uh, just keep an eye on him. Eventually Techno showed up and when I looked at him, he actually didn't look that bad here at the airport, but I, I found out later that he was wearing makeup to hide his yellow complexion. And then we met Dr. Lee, and uh, Dr. Lee, he was another cool guy. You know, and, and as much as Techno was giving Dr. Lee in the hospital a lot of trouble, the truth is, is that uh, Dr. Lee, he really liked Techno. Everybody liked Techno, and, uh, you know, he was, he was a very likable guy. So this is that point where, that pivotal point, in the movie where uh, I uh, confront Techno. And, you know, he has to willingly give, give up his, uh, his little stash of alcohol. You know, that was what that little uh, talk with Dr. Lee was all about. A certain period of time had to go by without him drinking before he could get a liver. So this was really the first step in, uh, in us being able to get him out of there. And... Uh, you know, he had, he had to willingly give us all his booze. It was a tough thing for him, but, you know, he wanted to get out of there. So, and then I, I removed that, that cat. Now, I'll get to the mystery of the cat later on. Yeah, I started my second massive swerve book there in China. Uh, did the whole book and the whole time I was there. And then uh, I came in to see Techno the next day. And uh, 
you know, this is very typical of Flora, but I recall a techno, he was, he was heaving into this bucket. Flora was kind of uh, straightening out his collar, you know, and uh, brushing his, his hair back over his ear, you know, and just kind of tidying him up. And I just thought that was, that was so nice of her to be doing that. Just trying to make him, you know, look a little bit presentable for me as I walked in. And here, if you notice, if I'm looking at a book, which is actually uh, a page from, from the Paris Cider book, you know, and, and this goddamn cat came back in again. And then, uh, yeah, we watched a lot of Seinfeld out there. It's funny to think that, uh, you know, uh, in order to get the TV clearances for using Seinfeld, that uh, I had to send them a clip of the, this particular clip of us watching Seinfeld in the hospital. And uh, that kind of uh, made those TV clearances go a little bit smoother. And so every day when Techno was up to it, we'd go for a little walk. And we'd usually go to the, the street market. And he'd uh, always look for some, some, you know, junk. He'd always look for, like, electronic junk that uh, he'd probably never use. And he was always trying to get a bargain from these guys, from these street vendors. So he, he liked to do that. And uh, we'd always end up at a restaurant. The thing with Techno is... He was never allowed to carry money. Someone always had to pay everything because uh, he wasn't to be trusted with any money. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why he wanted someone like me there in China because he wasn't having any luck with Flora. You know, he needed to be escorted every time he left the hospital. And I guess he thought if he was with someone like me, like a buddy, that he might have more luck in being able to... Uh, uh, you know, have a cocktail. And, uh, you know, after my discussions with Techno's father and, you know, that discussion in the hospital with Dr. Lee, you know, there's no way I was going to let Techno have any booze. I don't know what he was thinking, but, uh, you know, he was trying to have his way with me. After a while, my wife arrived. She didn't have to do that, but it made my life a little easier. And My wife had met uh, Techno in, in Kelowna, so they kind of knew each other from before. Yeah, we'd always make food for Techno and bring it up to the room. He never liked it. Never ate it. He didn't like the food over there. This first little section is about the TV clearances and as I mentioned, we had to get uh, Jason Alexander to, to sign off on us using his likeness here. Um, and then uh, this kind of friends opening. And uh, my name is Earl. And uh, Jamie Presley had to give us her okay to use her likeness there. It took months to get that sorted out. And, uh, yeah, techno... Uh, his situation over the course of time was getting getting worse and worse. You know, occasionally uh, he would be so sick we couldn't we couldn't really visit him for a couple of weeks, and uh, you know, and then after a while we'd, we'd be able to visit him again and we'd hang it out in his room. And, but we finally figured out the mystery of the uh, cat here. It turned out the cleaning lady uh, she she kept. Uh, she kept finding the cat in the courtyard, and I guess she thought she was doing us a favor by returning the cat to the room, you know, and that's how the cat just kept mysteriously, you know, sort of showing up back in the room. Yeah, Techno, uh, he was getting grief from his wife back in Vancouver, you know. It's unbelievable, really, that, you know, that uh, here he is sort of dealing with all this, all this stuff that he has to deal with in China. You know, and he, he, he really is, is dealing with uh, some, some big things here. And his, his wife kept phoning him up and, and bitching about money and, and bitching about this and that. And, you know, one day he just couldn't take it anymore. So this next little sequence here, Techno is... Uh, 
you know, he'd get clearance to come and, and visit me in the room. And he'd always bring, sometimes he'd bring his six pack. And he, 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 I guess he, at the end of the day, what he really wanted was he just wanted to have a couple of beers with his friends. That's what he wanted. I think that's why he wanted me there. He thought, oh, I'm going to, you know, have a buddy here and I can have a few drinks. But really, after talking to everybody, like the doctor and, and uh, to his father, you know, there was no way I was going to let that happen. You know, so then he'd end up giving us the slip and, and uh, trying to, you know, between my, my room and the hospital, he'd always try to, like, sneak a little drink and a smoke in there. So this next sequence is, uh, the skyline was changing so quickly back then, you know, in this building frenzy that was going on in China, sort of getting across this idea that time is passing. and It wasn't easy being in China. I enjoyed being with techno you know, for these few months, you know, and getting to know him again, and, you know, just the, sort of the three of us, you know, uh, just trying to, just getting along. I wouldn't have traded that for anything. You know, uh, as I mentioned in the story, um, Flora had made us aware that uh, the liver that we were waiting for was... Uh, coming from uh, somebody that was awaiting capital punishment in China. As soon as they were uh, executed, they'd, har they'd harvest the organs. And, and that's kind of where Techno was uh, getting his liver from. You know, and uh, the truth is, is that a lot of the livers that, were, that became available that were the same blood type were actually as bad or worse than Techno's liver, if you can believe it. So, you know... Uh, that's why it took so long, you know, uh, waiting for a quality liver to come in. Yeah, uh, holy crap, yeah, that was shocking, you know, seeing that pile of rubbish in the corner of the elevator. and It, it would be normal to see doctors in the hospital with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. and uh, You know that scene from Jacob's Ladder where he goes down to the basement of the hospital and the lights are flickering and stuff? That's what this this whole scene looked like. The lights were flickering, and, uh, you know, there were electrical wires dangling through the ceilings, and, yeah, it was it was really, like, uh, unbelievable, uh, the, the state of that uh, transplant ward. And, of course, we ran into the cat again, you know, which is just this recurring thing that kept happening to it, happening to us all the time. So, uh, you know, it... You can make of it what you will, uh, you know, superstition or whatever, but I don't believe that kind of stuff. It's pure comedy is what it is. So, yeah, you know, uh, several hours later, Flora contacted us and said that Mr. Lee had Techno's old liver, and uh, if we wanted to, we could come and have a look at it. And so, yeah, we agreed, and we had to look at this old liver. He was holding it in this tray, and... You know, the, to me, this was this was an indication that one way or the other, we were going to get out of here, and uh, so that's that's why we were so excited to to sort of see this liver. Yeah, then he got moved into his own little room in the isolation area. It was this was unbelievable. You know, him getting out of bed and then basically, you know, adjusting the TV set keeping in mind that he was stitched together from the top of his chest down, to, you know, to, the, to his stomach and from side to side like a big cross. So, yeah, he had a big setback after that. And, uh, and uh, then he started to recover. This was amazing, you know, the way his, his eyes started to, to become less yellow and then his skin complexion cleared up. And then he, he started to show signs of the old techno. Like He started to, to think a lot clearer, and he was a bit sharper. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing to see that recovery.
but he still couldn't leave his room. There was one point during this time where, where he was kind of in lockdown in his room. And, you know, uh, my wife and I were out uh, uh, doing something. And as we were coming back to the hotel, we saw him wandering around with the bag. So he was out for a little walkabout. And he had his little mask on, but somehow he had sort of snuck out of the room. You know, he had sort of brushed it off, like, oh, I just had to leave. But, um, you know, this this was the thing with techno is, is he, I guess he thought that his his uh, recovery was going so well that he was he was taking certain liberties and doing things. And it was this kind of overconfidence that was causing some concern. I would report back to Techno's father every day or every second day. And he warned us that, um, you know, don't be overconfident because he's not out of the woods yet. You know, like he's not putting on any weight. And Techno's father was right. He always was right. Yeah, in spite of the fact that Techno was out for the occasional walkabout, uh, you know, technically he was, he was kind of confined to, to his room. And so when it came time to plan the exit strategy here, you know, we had to run all his errands for him. So he was back in his room, barking orders. And, you know, he, he always liked to be like the guy in charge. So he was, he was uh, basically kind of coordinating this whole, uh, this whole exit strategy here, the, the gathering up the money, which wasn't easy. And then we'd have to check back on him periodically and, you know, he'd, he'd insist on, on us leaving the money there. The funny thing was he was, he was recovering, and there were, there were little glimpses of the old techno, and I had totally forgot, you know, because I hadn't seen this for a while, that techno could be a real cunt sometimes. And, you know, and, and he was doing precisely that to the nurses. And I just stopped talking to him for a while. And, you know, we had all sorts of other things we had to do. We had to go pay off the hospital, and, you know, with all the, the, the months of time that Techno spent at the hospital um, and all the, you know, the, the cost of the room, the cost of all the medicine and the IVs and the nurses and all the treatment that he got, not to mention the, uh, the cost of the, of the actual transplant procedure. And, and we also had to pay off the family of the donor, you know, they received some some uh, some money, uh, and then the hospital had to get paid, and all that added up to only thirty thousand dollars. And if you recall, uh, Vince, you know, the guy that brokered this whole deal, made two hundred and fifty thousand dollars up front, so he made almost ten times as much as all this other stuff, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the hard costs which, which Techno had incurred in China. It was, it's unbelievable how much of a shyster that, that Vince was. But So while we were out running around and taking care of, uh, you know, all, all the things that had to be taken care of for Techno, Meanwhile, you know, like we come back to the hospital and he's outside having a smoke like a cheeky fucking monkey again. You know, it's, it's just unbelievable, you know, the, the fact that, you know, here we are running around doing all this stuff for him because apparently he's not well enough to, to, to leave his room. And then he, he has, doesn't even have the courtesy, you know, just to fucking have a cigarette right in front of me, you know. And tell me that he stole a hundred remimbi of his own money. That was really the last straw for me. And some people have complained about this extra long black pause in here. I kind of like it. It's weird. So, uh, yeah. I gathered up techno and he gathered up all his stuff and headed to the airport. If you recall, he was, he was, uh, a bit dyslexic, and so, you know, I had to fill out his form for him. You know, like I mentioned in the story, this is where everything gets all screwed up. You know, uh, I, uh, in spite of my good intentions, you know, coming to China and helping, helping out, you know, techno, 
my overlooking my own uh, details with my visa it really had a an effect on 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 uh, Techno's ability to get home. And there was no way Techno was not going to go home on that flight. He was he was determined to, to go home. I, I guess he had paid for like a, a return uh, first class ticket, and you know, like I said, he kind of sweated the small stuff. Not that a first class ticket is cheap, but you know, I, he, that was really what was. Uh, that was what was forcing him to try to make it back home on that particular day because he didn't want to fork out money for another ticket. And so meanwhile, you know, these guys shook me down for about $700. And, and uh, I had to go to three different ATMs and gather up enough money. And then this is that funny moment where, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's this kind of... Uh, I don't know what it is, if it's a loyalty or, or something that you have to your old friends, even though you don't really have much in common. And I just remember, th you know, this feller, he was such a nice guy, and I, I just kind of thought, well, I could totally be friends with this guy. And, you know, for some reason, you know, just because I have history with techno, you know, and I'm kind of bending over backwards, you know, it, it, it didn't really seem like we were that close, you know, and yet, you know, I'm sort of doing all this stuff for somebody that, um, you know, meanwhile, I could just meet somebody and, and just, you know, just be as good or better friends with somebody that I met. So, you know, whatever. And so, you know, I had to catch up with techno and I arrived in the Hong Kong airport and I immediately sort of thought that he might be uh, in a bar somewhere or uh, and in one of the smoking rooms. So, you know, in, in the few hours that I was separated from him, you know, he had been through an ordeal. And uh, when I caught up to him, he, he was completely exhausted. And he sat on this bench that said wet paint, and he had those stripes going across the back of his white suit. And, uh, and then we proceeded to the airplane. So they wouldn't let me up in the first class. You know, otherwise I would have sat with them. So uh, I had to keep an eye on them from coach. So at some point, Techno came back to coach and sat next to me on the flight. And I remember uh, just how calm and relaxed he was. And uh, he was really looking forward to getting back home to Kelowna and, um, you know, getting his life going again and, you know, uh, making things work with his wife. And, uh, and you know, I'd, I hadn't really seen Techno that happy or that relaxed for years. And it really seemed like he, he was at uh, going to have a new beginning of, like, not drinking or at least that's what he was saying to us, you know. So here's the thing, is Techno should have gone directly into the hospital the moment that he arrived in Vancouver, but he had convinced everybody, like his family that was there, that he was all right and that he wants to go to a ha for a hamburger instead. And then he went home. You know, that evening he made a turn for the worse and he began to turn yellow again. And... Uh, uh, they rushed him to the Vancouver General Hospital. And, um, you know, he ended up there for uh, a few months. And there was one point where they let him out of the hospital for a while. And that's when he came over for Christmas dinner, like I mentioned at the beginning of the film. But then he slipped again and he went back into the hospital. And uh, when he went back in, his immune system was so low that he caught a brain infection in the hospital. And it was just some weird thing that was unrelated to the, the liver transplant. And, and basically this brain infection, it turned his brain into mush over the course of two weeks. And he ended up dying from that brain infection. You know, but I guess at that point his, his immune system was so low that he was just susceptible to, to uh, all sorts of infection. And he picked up something in the hospital. 
And at that point, my mind went to that dirty elevator in Guangzhou. And, uh, you know, in spite of, you know, on the surface, you know, uh, with the, the doctor smoking in the elevator and, and the rubbish in the corner, the truth is that he was getting excellent medical treatment in that hospital. And if, if he had, you know, just been able to hang on and spend a little bit more time in China, he might have recovered to the point where he, he could have made that really tough journey from China to Vancouver, and it would have been less stressful on him. And, uh, but the fact is that he was just so homesick, you know, after being away for so long, he just, he had to get home. You know, I got to accept my, my own responsibilities for my mismanagement of my own visa and how that affected techno, you know, uh, his, his journey back. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, responsible for, for his demise in a way as well. And so, you know, when everything was said and done, we were cleaning up techno stuff. We were with his, his wife and his uh, father at his place in Kelowna. And we found that uh, white suit with the black stripes going across the back of them. And uh, his wife went through the pockets and she found a, a book of matches that said uh, Brandy's Bar in the Hong Kong airport. And, and then I started to put the pieces together. Because I, I kind of, uh, I, I, I knew that he had a hundred renminbi note in his pocket, and he was alone for the first time, in in all the months that he was in China. There's nobody there, and so, he, you know, uh, so I know for a fact that he ended up going into a bar in the Hong Kong airport. Now, whether he ended up having a drink or not, uh, with that twenty, uh, with that uh, hundred renminbi note, no one can say. But um, it's just kind of interesting, you know, uh, to sort of put those pieces together after the fact, and uh, just have this image in my head of him sitting, you know, on on a bench that says "wet paint." across a bar, across, across from Brandy's bar in the Hong Kong airport. And he's just looking across at the bar. And he's got a hundred renminbi note in his hand. And at some point he, he decides to get up and walk into the bar. And, uh, and then who knows what happened? Who knows if he went and ordered a drink at, at the bar um, I, I'm not going to try to try to pretend like I know what happened, but part of me thinks like, you know, even if he had got back to Vancouver and recovered, you know, he, he probably would have slipped back into, into drinking again, especially if he was making a, a good recovery. I think that was probably, you know, his intention all along, you know, and I don't know. And looking back at the way things went, I probably wouldn't have, you know, if, if, I knew, if I knew back then what I know now, I probably just would have let him drink, you know, himself. And I probably would have joined him for a drink. <laughs> uh, anyways.